Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Supporters of an abortion ballot petition are vowing to keep fighting after the state elections board deadlocked on whether it should go on the November ballot. The proposal would put a woman's right to an abortion in the state constitution. The vote coming down just over an hour ago was two to two. Uh, and the vote from the election board means then that it does not move forward. It now sets the stage for a battle we would expect in the state Supreme Court. Rob Maloney live in Lansing with more on what comes next. Rod. Well, Devin, it was surprisingly unemotional in the meeting. It was highly attended, a lot of people there, but there was not a reaction to it, mainly because most everybody in the room expected this to be the outcome. And so what that means is that now it's off to the Supreme Court to try and figure out what happens there, and it has to happen quickly, probably on an emergency basis. The day-long hearing over two ballot proposals ended with both rejected. The reproductive freedom for all petition getting tossed because of a group of words that did not have proper spacing on the circulated petitions. Darcy McConnell is the spokesperson for reproductive freedom for all. There's a lot of, I guess, word salad from the opposition trying to confuse people about this issue. But the bureau was clear um, about what the role of the board is. Uh, the voters were clear. 730,000 of them said, we want to protect reproductive rights and restore Roe in Michigan. Michigan Right to Life led the opposition, and Genevieve Mornum told Local 4 News that she lost petition fights like this one in the past and knows the sting that comes with it. They threw away thousands and thousands of signatures on our dismemberment abortions because one H of the word, of the, word the was missing. So it's really very strict scrutiny that they have to do on these forms. Uh -huh. And I don't, you know, you and I can disagree that they should be that strict, but that is the rule. As for what happens next, former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid says a lot has to happen very quickly here. Time is of the essence. September 6th is next week. And so if they want to act, they need to file quickly. And then a court would have discretion to decide whether it wants to grant relief to prevent that from happening or if it's going to try to make a decision quickly to be able to accommodate that. Now, both sides did not want to have any more real discussion about what's to happen with the Supreme Court. They don't want to get ahead of things, and they don't want to say something that's going to come up in a hearing. And so now, just the question of when they have this hearing and how quickly it can be adjudicated. Back to you. Now, we've got another track that's been moving along here, Rod. So does this mean anything for the Court of Appeals uh, attempting to stay the 1931 abortion law? Well, as it stands right now, and I asked Barbara McQuaid this question because she's uh, certainly more qualified to answer it. She basically said that they will take this up first and take care of that and then see what happens with the ballot. And if it doesn't get to the ballot, then things change in terms of what goes on and perhaps the Supreme Court having to deal with that mm, yeah. after the ballot proposal gets taken care of. Because that 1931 law and the governor's fight against that has sort of been looming in the background here all along. All right, Rod. Rod Maloney reporting from Lansing. Meanwhile, Metro Detroiters finding ways to try to get by as tens of thousands of people go on now 48 hours with no power. DTE says more than 164,000 customers are still in the dark after Monday's storms. They're hoping to have power restored to at least half the customers by tonight and 80 percent by tomorrow night. Megan Woods is live in Shelby Township. Megan, from libraries to churches, everyone is trying to make the best of all of this. That's right, and we've been all over. Like you mentioned, we're in Shelby Township right now, but we've been in Detroit, West Bloomfield, and some of those places, they're seeing restored power, like the traffic like we're at right now, but it's not necessarily working properly, and that's the challenge that a lot of people are facing. So communities during this frustrating time are stepping up to give some encouragement. Three long hot days. The hard part is not knowing when restoration is coming. Whether you live in Detroit, West Bloomfield, or Shelby Township, these last three days without power have been exhausting. It was kind of rough for us because the kids were getting around for school in the morning, they didn't have light. It doesn't help that many people are also still working from home. In Shelby Township, people flock to the library. About 15 minutes before we opened on Tuesday morning, our parking lot was packed. There wasn't a space to be had um, and people were even parking across the street and walking over. Community organization Friends of the Shelby Township Library were able to purchase pizza and snacks and now signs like this are at the entrance. It's the least we can do is to provide a little comfort. Then there's places like Triumph Church in Detroit. 
Despite the loss of power and no PA system, no AC, and no lights, they move forward with Bible classes Tuesday and Wednesday. They had a funeral. We we're doing a lot of fanning, uh, the old school church fans that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, also, uh, the dome allows for natural light to come in. They say in times like this, they still have to serve the people. We have the capacity. Uh, to rise above our circumstances, whether it be temporary uh, or even more chronic and long term. Uh, but I think it's important when everything else shuts down uh, for the church to be ever present. And we did speak to DTE earlier. They say on top of the more than 1,000 linemen they had out in the field on Monday and Tuesday, today they have more than 1,000 from out of state helping. They're working around the clock to restore power. They also say if you need water and ice, they have distribution sites, and we have that on clickondetroit.com. Live in Shelby Township, I'm Megan Woods, Local 4. It is so frustrating, but we know those men and women who are working the lines, they're doing the best that they can. Megan, we appreciate your update tonight. And this just in, the Boyle Water Advisory in Commerce Township and Wald Lake has been lifted, but it is still in effect in Novi. A Great Lakes Water Authority station temporarily lost power Monday, sparking that order. A 19-year-old is formally charged in a random shooting spree on Detroit's west side. Prosecutors have charged Dante Smith in the spree that left four people shot, three of them dead. Smith facing three counts of first-degree murder and several other charges as well. These shootings all took place in a period over about two and a half hours early Sunday morning. Meanwhile, we are hearing from the only survivor of the shootings, John Pollock, along with his dog, both suffered non-life-threatening injuries, fortunately. He recalled his encounter with the gunman. He stayed behind the car and shot. First two shots hit him. And then the, then the second two shots, he got me right in here. Smith right now being held without bond. Also, Detroit police need your help in identifying one of the victims. She was shot and killed around 530 Sunday morning in the area of Margarita and Wyoming. Police say she had a multicolored purse that contained uh, New York uh, green New York basketball shorts inside, as you see here. If you've got any information on uh, who this might be, and again, this is now uh, three days since the shooting, please call Crime Stoppers right away. Students are returning back to school, and safety is top of mind for so many parents right now. Tonight, one district is being proactive to prevent tragedies, and they're doing it with these key fobs. Kim DiGiulio is in Northville to show us how they work. Here at Northville High School, there are more than 40 doors to get into this building, all of which are locked. But in the event of an emergency, our first responders need to be able to get in. But gaining access or even breaking down this door could be the difference of life and death. We don't want in Northville any officer to have to think, how do I go and do what I need to do right now? Northville Public School Superintendent R.J. Weber explains their district's plan on how to be proactive in an event that first responders would need to enter a building in their district. Everything changed in uh, the world of education after Columbine. Everything. That's why today the police officers who serve in this district received FOBs that allow immediate access to every door in every school in the district. We cannot afford to have any type of delay in entering the school. And so by having the electronic access fobs, it's going to let our officers immediately get to the threat and immediately stop it. It's all electronic, so it eliminates the fear of what would happen if one was misplaced. Now let's say you lose one of these, so you let the, the station know that you did, and our team can turn it off in a second. Weber says this was an idea their district came up with together, and he hopes it's something more districts adopt, as many already have the technology installed. Let's share this with our brothers and sisters in education and law enforcement as widely as we can to help people see that there are many things that can already be done without having to wait for a mandate or legislation or even additional funding. All three departments, Novi, Northville and Northville Township received those fobs today, which means this Tuesday when the school year starts, those officers will be ready. Reporting in Northville, I'm Kim DiGiulio, Local 4. All right, Kim, now to health news today. A new durable surface coating that can kill bacteria 
and viruses, plus how some simple tests of physical function might help people find people at higher risk of serious cardiovascular disease. But first, Dr. Frank McGeorge is here with new data showing a decrease in Americans' life expectancy, Doc. Yeah, Kim and Devin. So according to the CDC, life expectancy at birth dropped by nearly a year in 2020 and 2021, going from 77 years to just a little over 76 years. Now, the last time it was that low was actually 1996. Now, as expected, COVID-19 drove about half of the decline, but a rise in accidental deaths and drug overdoses, along with heart disease and chronic liver disease, also contributed. Now, here's an interesting thing. The life expectancy gap between men and women also grew in 2021. For women, the life expectancy is now almost six years longer than men, at 79 years compared to a man's 73 years. Now, a team of University of Michigan engineers has developed a new durable surface coating that in testing can kill surface bacteria and viruses for months. So the polyurethane coating, which is clear, can actually be brushed or sprayed on, and it gets its germ-killing power from the antimicrobial molecules derived from tea tree oil and cinnamon oil, which have both been used for centuries as effective germ killers that work in under two minutes. The researchers estimate this technology could actually be commercially available within a year. Now, finally, a new paper published in the Journal of the American Heart Association finds a simple test of physical function in people over 65 could help identify those at increased risk of serious cardiovascular disease. Now, the test actually looks at simple things like walking speed, leg strength, and even balance. So really, the bottom line to this is, as we age, declines in physical function that are, are really important markers of potentially worsening health. Back Interesting. to you. Interesting. Okay, Dr. McGeorge, thank you. Got